Thank you so much for being here. Um, we've arrived at a topic uh, that's one of those ones, it's, 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 it's uh, like when you're driving through the desert and you see something uh, in the distance and when you get really close you think, is it really there or not? We talk in Australia a lot about um, inequality. Is it, is it there or not? Do we really have a problem with, uh, with, with worsening inequality in Australia? And in a, in a sense, if you look at retirement outcomes, it tells you a lot about what is happening across people's lives and how they're living their lives and their sense of well-being and their financial comfort and their sense of fulfilment, not just in a financial sense, but throughout their whole lives. So you're kind of the canary in the cage. So this forum is, is called Fair Go No More with a question mark on the end of it because we're going to drive close to it and see whether there's any there there. Um, uh, ME Bank does this interesting thing uh, where they do their financial, household financial comfort report, uh, which they've done now for a number of years. Uh, it's in its sixth year, and it gives you an, a, a, an idea of how Australians are feeling uh, on the relaxed and comfortable, ease the squeeze uh, line. What happens when you actually ask Australians those questions about themselves? So we're going to start this session uh, with Matthew Reid, who's the Head of Public Relations for ME, just taking us through what that latest household financial comfort report shows. Uh, and then we're going to come to a panel discussion. And um, John here beside me, John Powell, uh, is going to speak for ME, which confused me. Because there's two ME's, which makes an us, doesn't it? Me and me. <laughs> but I, I just have to get my head around that. Um, so John is the General Manager of Tre uh, Treasury Sales at, at ME, and he's going to be part of our panel discussion on it. Andrew Baker, uh, who's sitting beside him to my left, is a partner UK EMEA at NMG Consulting. And Andrew, I read a report. Uh, I, I, had, I have two hats. One's a journalist uh, and one's a moderator here. My journalist, I did not have my journalist hat on when I read your not yet released to the media short of sleep work. <laughs> report, but it's a very interesting report on what, um, what is starting to happen uh, with people in non-traditional work, and it really quantifies the number of people. It's, really, it's a really great report, it really quantifies the number of people uh, who are missing out, the extent to which they're missing out, and what we might do about that as work, the nature of work changes. Uh, according to Andrew, John Daly, who's sitting to his left, is just here to complain about stuff. I think that's harsh. Uh, John is the Chief Executive Officer of the Grattan Institute. Uh, and if I put a dollar into superannuation for every time I read an excellent report from that institute to prepare for um, the, my program that I present the drum, uh, the power of compound interest would mean I retired a wealthy woman. So uh, John has a range of views as well as controversial views about to what extent are we emphasising people putting funds aside too much in the years in which they are trying to make ends meet, uh, and whether 12% uh, superannuation guarantee is really a good idea given that set of circumstances for everyone. So there you are. Uh, so uh, please welcome all the panellists to start with. Give them a round of applause. And we're going to start with uh, Matthew Reid, who's going to take us through how comfortable we really are. So Australia has had 26 years of uninterrupted economic growth. Um, household, and over that time, households have accumulated record wealth. I think recently the figure reached $10 trillion. Incomes have continued to grow, although in recent times they've slowed down quite a bit. It still feels like the lucky country. So you might expect household finances to be in excellent shape. Um, well, as I'm about to present to you, that's not how a lot of households are actually feeling. So good morning, my name is Matthew Reid, I'm Head of actually External Affairs now, my title has slightly changed. That's okay. Me was set up 26 years ago to help all Australians get ahead, so it made sense that seven years ago we decided we'd set up a survey to try and understand perhaps where some households are falling behind. Um, so we set up the Household Financial Comfort Report. And as Ellen said, this is a survey we do every six months. We've done 13 of them now since 2011. And it's a survey of 1,500 households, uh, which are a representative sample across Australia. One of the perhaps most important things about the survey, though, is that it asks people to rate how they feel about the finances in their household. 
So whilst this is a subjective measure, it also asks people to think about their finances as a whole and in context, and we believe that in asking it that way, you get a very meaningful measure of how people are really doing. So as a backdrop for today's panel discussion, I'm just gonna take you through four insights that we've consistently seen over the last seven years of doing the survey. Insight number one, as I've alluded to in the opening statement, Households on average aren't doing as well as you might have expected given the macro context. So I've got a chart on the screen and before I get into the chart I'll just quickly explain there's going to be a few charts coming up and they're all designed in the same way. On the vertical axis there is a score from 0 to 10 and that is a measure of financial comfort out of 10. On the bottom on the horizontal Axis is a time scale, and that's all the uh, 13 surveys that we've done since 2011. Now, the chart you're looking at right now shows what we call the Household Financial Comfort Index. Now, this is an overall average, a score out of 10 across all Australian households that we derive from 11 different measures in the household. And as you can see, since we've been doing the survey in 2011, it hasn't really shifted much above five out of 10. It's currently sitting at about 5.44 out of 10. So I guess the point though is that this is an average. And when you dig under the surface, you see that a lot of households are doing well. But what we're finding also is a lot of households aren't doing well and things are getting worse for those households. And that is bringing down the overall average. Second insight, which really follows on from the first, is when you dig under, as I said, you do find big gaps between different groups of people. Some having higher comfort and it's increasing, but you are seeing other groups with low financial comfort and that financial comfort has been falling. So I'm gonna show you four different charts that demonstrate that quite well, I think. The first way is breaking the data down by different households. So we have a number, I think we have about seven to eight households in the survey. Retirees consistently come out as being the most comfortable, financially comfortable group in the survey, about six out of 10. And if you look at self-funded retirees, they're at about 6.8 out of 10. And I think you can safely say that many, it's probably because many retirees, particularly self-funded, you know, have benefited from those rising asset prices. Um, they're off, most likely debt free. Uh, they're cashed up and they're, and they're enjoying their income streams in retirement. But if you look at the other end of the scale, you've got single parent households. Now they're consistently the lowest, show the lowest financial comfort of any household at 4.5 out of 10. And when you look at uh, single parents relying on a government assistance, that's much lower at 3.2 out of 10. And then in between, we have all the other households at various different levels on slightly different trajectories. But the point being, very different um, levels of comfort for different households. Let's have a look at a different way of breaking down the data. This one's by income, and unsurprisingly, you'd see that high income earners, over 200,000, they've got the highest financial comfort of all. Um, and again, low income households, 40,000 or under, have very low financial comfort and it's going sideways. And in between, we have all the other lower to middle income households and they're in between um, in terms of comfort. But the main point here really is that of all those lines that you can now see on the chart, it's only the high, highest income households that have their financial comfort increasing over time. All the others are really going sideways. Um, and I think one of the things we've found from the report is that that group, the high income group, they're the ones getting the income gains compared to the other households. So they are benefiting from income gains over time and their household financial comfort is going up. A third way of breaking down the data is by generations. Baby boomers who are 55 to 74 year olds, they've got the highest comfort and it's rising quite dramatically. Gen Y, 25 to 34 year olds. They have also have improving comfort, but it's on a, slower, a lower trajectory. But then if you look at Gen X, now this is 35 to 54 year olds, their financial comfort's falling quite dramatically. 
And I think you can probably say that Gen X, in particular, are, more than other households, are dealing with debt. And I'd say that would be related to mortgages. And as a consequence, they tend to, and we find this in the survey, they tend to have lower or no cash savings, which means less ability to manage financial emergencies and much, um, much more vulnerability when it comes to uh, unexpected job loss. So this generation of all, all the generations that we measure seem particularly vulnerable. And the final way of breaking up the data to see how different groups are faring in comparison is by home ownership profile. So we start here with owning your home outright. They're doing very well, uh, up at six, about 6.5 out of 10. Then if we look at the mortgagees, they're also increasing financial comfort, but much lower, and that's because they're carrying debt, obviously. But look at renters. Renters are going down, and they've got the lowest comfort of all. I think this chart of all the charts demonstrates the housing affordability issue playing out. Homeowners who fully paid out their home loans, they're really enjoying that asset gain, value gain. Mortgagees also gaining, but they have the debt. Renters, I think, are feeling left behind. They've got no asset to rise in value, and often they're dealing with rising rents in inner city locations. So just to sum up those four charts, we see big variations in comfort, financial comfort between different groups. Some are doing well and improving, others not so well and falling. Uh, and I think you could classify those doing well as being, generally speaking, older, higher income uh, homeowners compared to younger, lower income renters. Okay, under the third insight. And this is around superannuation. And I guess it's interesting, we've had the superannuation guarantee since 1994. So you might have expected super to be one area of strength among households, but we consistently find um, that things aren't so super. We find, uh, we ask in every survey what people are most worried about. They get to nominate their biggest financial worry. And um, adequacy, of lifestyle in retirement is consistently in the top three of their worries. And there are about 15 worries that they can nominate. We consistently find uh, evidence of inadequate savings for retirement. A significant number, th a third, say they'll only have enough super for essentials. And indeed 10% say they won't even have enough for that. And 20% say they'll be financially independent when it gets to retirement. Not, not as high as you might expect. And there are also signs of disengagement a quarter don't know or don't have a super fund, uh, and a fifth, only a fifth say they're actively saving for retirement. So you have to sort of ask yourself, given all the changes I've had to super over recent years, you know, are the settings right? Um, and the other point perhaps to make, and this perhaps could be discussed by the panel later, is given so much wealth is tied up in the property, um, do we need to consider unlocking the value of the home? And just another quick chart on superannuation that just demonstrates that it's consistently, uh, people feel consistently low financial comfort around their superannuation. It's just hovering over five, and of the 11 measures that make up the overall um, household financial comfort index, superannuation is consistently in the bottom third in terms of how they feel about it. And just quickly, this issue raises itself again and again in every survey, women feeling much less comfortable with their superannuation than men. Final insight is around the nature of employment. And this is around the type of job you have, whether it's full-time, part-time or casual. And I think this is particularly relevant because I think we have seen quite a big change in the nature of employment over the last decade. So what we find, and if you look at this chart, it demonstrates it quite well, I think, that only full-time workers amongst all those workers are seeing their, their comfort increasing over time. Casual and part-time workers have lower comfort and it's been falling. And we pick up a couple of things in the survey which may suggest why this is occurring. The first is under, underemployment. 20% of part-time and casual workers that we survey say that they would like to be working more hours. They would like to be earning more to make the more of life and opportunities. The other finding we consistently find with part-time and casual workers is job uncertainty. Um, they are much more likely um, than other workers to say that they'd find it difficult to find employment 
uh, within two months if they became unemployed. So that group, those groups are feeling uncertain about their jobs and they want to be working more hours. And just a final chart, this goes back to an, a point I made earlier about the higher income households seeing their comfort go up compared to all other income groupings whose comfort doesn't seem to be going up at all. This really demonstrates that that group are getting the income gains. Now these, these charts show which people said they had a pay rise in the last six months. The column on the left is the entire sample and you can see that about a third, 34% of all households said they had a pay rise in the last six months. The next four columns break that data down by different income levels from low up to high. And as you can see, the size of that yellow bar increases the higher the income you get. And when you get to people earning over $100,000, half, half of that group say that they had pay rises in the last six months compared to only 19% of low income earners. So just to sum up, four insights I provided to you this morning. People aren't feeling as comfortable, Australian households aren't feeling as comfortable as they perhaps might have given the macro context, given 26 years of uninterrupted growth in this country. We see big gaps in comfort between different groups. And I think you can say from seeing those charts that those gaps are widening. So you could argue that there is rising inequality amongst many groups. Superannuation is consistently a concern for households. Uh, another interesting point, considering we've had the super guarantee since 1994, and the type of work you're in is, has a huge bearing on the trajectory of your financial comfort. Okay, so there's two um, areas. I'm, I might just direct the conversation for a little bit and then we'll come to your questions. Please float your questions through um, on the app. That's, that's open for you now. Um, uh, let me start with you, Andrew. There seem to be two elements to um, what that um, uh, household comfort uh, survey is talking about. And um, they're talking about a generational divide. And I'll talk maybe talk to John about that, John Daly about that in a sec. And then the other one they're talking about is how people work, right? Whether they're working full-time and part-time and how they feel about that and what they think their prospects are of you know, finding another job if they lost one and so forth, being able to survive however many weeks. Um, you've done this piece of research. Take us through, um, uh, quantify for us the changing nature of uh, the way we work, uh, non-traditional ways of working. Uh, and that, and uh, what are these ways of working and who are the people within it who are vulnerable to uh, not uh, getting enough super or in some cases any super? Okay, so um, inequality is rising around the world. Okay, so it's not an Australian problem. And it's rising mostly because the way the economy is working at the moment is, is more the returns from technology and restructuring are going to the very top. So that's why it's, why it's broadening. The problem is we have to make sure the people at the bottom are not left behind. And, and super, you know, it, it, which is a national achievement, you know, we, we should be proud of what's been created. There's nothing like it. It is one of the ways we keep, keep the bottom going with us. It's absolutely critical. And the problem that we're seeing with the way that work is changing is that the super system is becoming less universal. It's one of its great strengths is everyone is in it. And what we're seeing with the way that work is changing is that uh, more people are working part-time and casual. And we have a super system which has many strengths, but it was built for a workforce of 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mostly male, mostly full-time. A workforce that is more female, more part-time, more casual, more contractual, wasn't built for that. So more people are falling outside. The, the other big change, we've, we've far from seen the impact of this fully yet, is, is the impact of technology. So the rise of um, platforms such as Uber, other things like that, assist with slicing and dicing work into smaller pieces which fall underneath that 450 a month. It, it accelerates the movement to contracting, makes that much easier. And who, who, who knows when Uber was founded? When was it launched? Who knows? 
2015, 16? It's 2011. But it's, it's, it's only seven years ago. Mm. So with those kinds of things, it's like we always overestimate the short term, we underestimate the long term. So we haven't even started to see the full implications of technology on the workforce. But with this rotation between to, from full-time to part-time and casual, and from employment to con contracting, that doesn't fit well with our super constructs. So we have more people falling out of coverage of SG, and we have more people falling behind as a result. And I think you estimated that the, uh, the, the people who are missing out, as everybody in this room would know, would be uh, people on low incomes, um, you know, or, or if they've sliced and diced to the, to the point that they don't, um, that, that, that they're below the 450, uh, the self-employed and then the issues around sham contracting and people who have second jobs, which is another way of saying the same thing, isn't yes. it? That you've got that many atomised jobs that you don't... And you're estimating that 2.3 million, is that correct, Australians currently are in that, are in that group and that the superannuation foregone at the moment is about $10 billion. So what is your expectation of how how that, will that problem get worse over time and how, have you quantified how much worse it will get? Yeah, it will get worse. The, I mean, the workforce will continue to rotate and, and part of the movement to part-time and contracting is that's the way people want to work. It's not just employers doing, it's a change in how people behave. Um, but they fall through the cracks when, when they do that. So the, the workforce has been moving from full-time to part-time and casual about 0.4% per annum for quite a long time. We think that will continue, maybe not quite as fast. And we think with technology, it will continue to rotate more gradually to contracting over time. So we think in 10 years, it's, it's about 3 million people who miss out, which becomes one in five. And I think, you know, at one in five, we don't have a universal system anymore. That, that is just too big a hole. We'll never get it perfect, mm. but one in five is too much. Yeah, you suddenly, you suddenly don't have the threshold. And I think the figures in your document, am I okay to just shout out the figures yeah, in your document? Yeah. Were, um, I can't remember over the, what period of time, but I think it was up till 2030, was that right? That the amount of super foil gone would go from $10 billion to $27 billion. Yeah, it's a big gap. Yeah. It's a big gap. And that, that makes a big difference for... Uh, people on low incomes, you don't need a million dollars in super to make a big difference to retirement yeah. Retirement outcomes. Okay, now John, jump in. I'll ask you a question. You can choose to answer it otherwise, but it just makes me feel more fulfilled. Um, so, so thinking about then uh, the issue of wealth across generations, um, a paper you did a while back had a bit of, a, bit of, um, a stunning bit of... I mean, we all know the, the, the issue with housing affordability. We all know the, the issues with property. But when you quantify it, you were saying that um, f uh, over the 12 years to 2015, 2016, 65 to 74-year-olds would have increased their wealth by about half a million bucks, 45 to 54-year-olds by about $400,000, 35 to 44-year-olds, 120 grand. So um, very much that ME Bank... Uh, 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 financial comfort report, while it is qualitative stuff, is very much reflecting what the ABS and the Hilda data and everything else are telling us about uh, the wealth inequality picture. Yeah, and I think it's really helpful to kind of split this into thinking about income inequality and wealth inequality. Because yeah. if we look at income inequality in Australia, over the last 15 years, it hasn't actually changed very much. So the, the top 20% has gone up a little bit faster than everyone else, and you're seeing that in the data that was presented a little earlier um, with the, those over 200,000, although bear in mind that's probably only about 3% of the um, households. Um, uh, that's gone up, but otherwise it's not too bad. It's pretty well spread. Uh, if you look at income after housing costs, that's less well spread. Essentially, the bottom has indeed gone up less quickly than the top, but it's also worth remembering that even then, the bottom has gone up by about 15% in real terms over you know, a 15-year period. That's not to be sniffed at. But what is very different is wealth inequality. Essentially, those who had a lot of wealth got a lot wealthier. Mm. Those who had um, not very much wealth didn't see much at all. Uh, and then, of course, that also plays out um, across generations because inherently 45-year-olds tend to have more assets than 25-year-olds. Interest rates fell and so asset prices went up and that was terrific. Because if you think about it, the average household today, age 55 to 64, increased its wealth by about $600,000 in the last 10 years. Now, the average household did not save $60,000 a year. Nothing like 
Uh, what happened was that they were in the right place at the right time. They had reasonably large super assets. They had reasonably large housing assets. Um, and as interest rates fell, they made out like bandits. Yeah, so, so <laughs> I mean, that, that's the ultimate, isn't it? In <laughs> made out like bandits. The difference between income and wealth is that for a lot of Australians, their house earned more per year than they did. Yeah, uh, and their super did too. Yeah, right. Uh, it's worth remembering. I mean, their, their super assets were quite large. Um, in the scheme of things, it's about a third of their total wealth, a bit more than that. Um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a big free kick. Um, where, of course, this plays out, given this kind of intergenerational thing and also given what we're seeing in terms of, um, of spending patterns is, well, what do we want to do about this? Because one of the kind of slightly odd things about superannuation, in particular the superannuation guarantee, is that if you increase it, the bottom 20 or 30% of households actually wind up with less to spend in retirement than otherwise. I realise that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but let me explain why. They wind up with less in retirement. Why is that? Because those who are on low incomes don't put very much into super. It's just a small percentage of a relatively small number. Um, on the other hand, their final incomes are essentially driven by the age pension. Dirty secret, with respect, the bottom 20 or 30% are never going to have very much super, or more to the point, income from super, relative to the age pension, which is pretty generous. Consequence of that is if you increase the superannuation guarantee, you depress wages. I realise that various people claim that's not true, but that is clearly what happens in real life. Uh, the way that employers think about it is if I'm going to give you an extra percent in super, I'm going to push your uh, wages down by a percent. Uh, and indeed, most people in the private sector, of course, are on total employment contracts, uh, total, to, um, yeah, total employment contracts that effectively um, uh, encapsulate that. So when you reduce wages, of course, the pension is indexed to actual wages. And when the ABS measures wages, quite rightly, it ignores superannuation. So if you increase the super guarantee, what happens is that wages grow by less than you would expect otherwise, and so the pension grows by less than you expect otherwise. So the consequence of pushing up the super guarantee is really good for the top 20% because we force them to save even more and they wind up with even more in retirement than they would otherwise. Pretty good for those in the middle who arguably are what the superannuation system has always been about. And for people in the bottom 20 or 30%, they essentially are either flat or going backwards. And that's in retirement. And of course, pre-retirement, we've asked them to have less money than they would otherwise. And of course, if you think about the data that's just been presented, they are the households under stress. I look at all of that data and go, so just remind me one more time why it is that we think that 65-year-olds are under so much financial stress that they all need to, we need to tell all the 40-year-olds to save lots more. I look at the data and go, the only people who seem vaguely comfortable about their current financial situation, in which, of course, they didn't save as much as we are forcing people to save at the moment during their working life, they're the only ones who are happy about life. <laughs> OK. Uh, John Powell, if I can turn to you. Um, in, in essence, um, when you're looking at retirement incomes, what you're trying to do is work out for, for uh, the next cohort of Australians who are going to retire, how, how do you bridge that gap between wealth and income, and particularly in retirement incomes? What, what are your sorts of ideas for uh, helping retirees to maybe tap the equity uh, of their homes, as Matthew was suggesting in his presentation, um, and, and helping to uh, reduce that inequality? Uh, between generations. Yeah, I think um, the work that we've been doing at, at, at me, it's not ME anymore. Sorry. Right? Yeah, so we've got to be on brand. There's some marketing people me, in the room. Me, you and us. That's got right. Um, is we realise the, the pillar that housing brings yeah. to dignity in retirement. So really we're looking through that lens of how do we get people into housing and then hopefully they own a home and they get to retirement and they've built up substantial equity in their house. And as many people here will know, a lot of retirees are coming with very large... Uh, balances in housing equity, but relatively low balances in their superannuation. So housing is critical to the outcome for, for Australian retirees. And, you know, it's natural that people who are paying off a mortgage feel stress, but I think that won't change. We'll see that, you know, our parents talked about it and our grandparents talked about it. So from our perspective, it's how do we get people in? 
We think that one of the things that may change over time is we always look at housing through a debt solution. Can it be an equity solution? Do you have to own all of your house? Does shared equity or those sorts of products lead to allowing people to get into home ownership, but you might not own all of your house? All of you in this room who have superannuation all own a fractional interest in property. It's commercial property. But for housing, it's binary. It's 100 or zero. So how do we get those renters who have demonstrated that they can make payments to own part of a house and does that work for them? On the flip side, once people are uh, now retired and they've got this large balance, is how do we convert that equity into a, an annuity stream? Mm. Uh, we're very conscious of, um, you know, we don't want 65-year-olds taking out $100,000 and buying two new cars and going on a cruise because that's cons consumed and gone. But how do you release that equity in a way to top up their, you know, their generous pension if, for some, to allow them to have that, that, better, um, that better retirement? That's a debt-type solution, and that brings all sorts of challenges, but we're, we're hopeful that this year we'll be working on some products that allow retirees to actually top up their income, especially in what we call the go-go years, so from 65 to 75, we're very, very active. <laughs> That's very good, the yes. go-go years. Yeah, then we have the no-go, which is 75 to 85. Right. And then after 85, it's called the oh-no. <laughs> um, because the other thing, and just the other thing we also need to be, you know, as we start to think about our own retirement and our parents, is also aged care and what that looks like as well. So there's a number of moving parts that, you know, we need to plan for. I mean, I was interested to read, um, uh, Andrew, in your report that um, you were sort of talking about the next big reform in super. And, and you, your focus was not so much the 450, the sham contracting, all of those things. Yes, tick all those boxes. But it was about um, redefining super as an entitlement of work, all work. Um, uh, descri describe what you're talking about there. Sure. So um, super is a construct of employment at the moment. You, you have to have a, an, an actual job to be entitled to super and you have to earn more than $450 a month. And 25 years ago, that's how Australia looked. Um, but it, it doesn't look that way anymore. So, um, you know, there's an increasing case that whether you're employed, whether you're on a contract, whether you're self-employed, we need to work out how to, how to apply superannuation to that. So I think self-employment is, is, is another really important area. So there's 1.2 million self-employed Australians, we should encourage that, but they don't have to contribute to super, only about a fifth of them do. Um, and the theory why they're exempt is that they're going to build this business and they're going to sell that and that's yep. going to fund retirement. That's, that's what's going to happen. But it doesn't happen. So there are very generous um, CGT exemptions for selling a small business. We know there's only about 4,000 of those done a year. So it's, it's a drop in the ocean. So the, the exemption of self-employment from super is not working. In, uh, too often the business doesn't work out, it's not worth anything. And, and these people retire with, with very little. Although what we do see, Andrew, is that those people who are self-employed save a lot more outside of super than they do inside super. Now, that's very bad news for everyone in this room, but it's not necessarily a bad policy outcome. Yeah, they do save more, but it's not that much more. Um, it's certainly not enough to, to compensate. Um, and, of course, it's highly skewed. I mean, it's, it's an average, not a median, so it, it certainly doesn't fill the hole. Yeah, well, I mean, that's something we've actually studied in quite a lot of detail, and the distribution's actually pretty good, uh, and the, the non-super assets outside of super are actually a big deal for an awful lot of households, and particularly for those who are self-employed. Um, and it's not just a small fraction of them, it's a lot of them. Sure. Let's turn to um, some questions coming in from the floor. We have quite a few. Um, maybe, uh, firstly, a question on the MeBank research. What caused the rise in comfort across all charts in December 2014? What did cause that? That's gonna... Yes? Let's look at the chart. The rise that year, we suspect, was a sampling change. Right. I think the methodology behind DBM sampling slightly changed and where that got corrected. So that is potentially an anomaly. Ellen, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you've raised a good point there though because the, um, the, the ME report's a very good one, but you know, I think we've worked hard to pull the most miserable conclusions out of it. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the best point to read the ME report is, is start at page 30. <laughs> That's when it gets interesting, because if you look at all the, 
the long-term trends are all pointing north. If you look at you know, comfort with savings, comfort with investments, comfort with super, it doesn't matter what you point to, the past six years, the trend is north. So things are not getting worse overall. Things in aggregate are getting better. Mm -hmm. you know, if we look at that, you know, de that demographic divide, well, yeah, those baby boomers are pretty happy, and we hate the baby boomers for everything, but Correct. Gen Y is pretty happy too. Yeah. It's just those poor Gen Xs with the, with the mortgages who are the unhappy lot in the country. And you think that's a time of life issue as much as well, anything else? It's certainly part of it. Yeah. Uh, how will the generational wave of retiring baby boomers downsizing affect the property market if X and particularly Y generations can't afford to buy a house? Um, well, for anyone who saw Q&A on Monday night, they would have seen John talking about population growth. Mm. And there's a you know, large debate at the moment around big Australia. And when Kevin Rudd first said it, we all fell off, you mm -hmm. know, sort of fell over walking along. And now we're already there or well on the way. So I think it's all very good talking about the, the, the baby boomers maybe downsizing. But the population numbers are you know, significantly underpinning housing in this country. And then there's the geographic overlay with Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, mm -hmm. and where the population's going. So I don't think it's a concern that you're going to see this property market just, just fall over. Um, certainly there's people who are you know, choosing housing that they might, other, not, might not otherwise prefer to be in, which is the apartments, you know, given the restriction of land and the availability of the land being close to CBD. But I certainly don't think you're going to see a, a major correction in the housing market absent a broader global shock. I don't know, John, if you want to... Yeah, I mean, housing markets are like any other markets. They can be overpriced and underpriced from time to time. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, but the long-term future is short of a very radical shift in Australia's migration policy or short of a very radical change in our planning policy, which essentially limits the amount of supply that comes on. My guess is it'll do pretty well. Um, and it's, I think it's worth remembering that when, the, when people do downsize, firstly, they tend not to downsize till about 75 because the dominant motivation is essentially around... Um, I can't keep up with the garden, I can't get up the stairs, I can't, you know, I've, I've finally got to the point that I really just can't cope with the fourth bedroom and cleaning it. Um, uh, and so that's the dominant motivation for downsizing. And then the dominant desire when people to downsize is to basically stay in the suburb, same suburb. Mm. And they also typically don't actually extract much equity when they do, because what happens is they effectively move out of a house that they have done not a lot of maintenance on for the last 15 years, <laughs> um, and uh, albeit is you know reasonably large, um, uh, but then move into the schmick new apartment uh, down the road, and so they effectively you know, improve their standard of living, uh, but don't actually take much money out of it. And, and what it shows is that, um, what, the, what the data shows is that the, the financial incentives around downsizing are pretty weak. People don't take that much out of it, and actually that's not the reason they do it. And, and does anyone on the panel have any views on whether when interest rates eventually go up, that will have any impact on the wealth distribution we see across Australia? House prices will go down if that happens. Mm. Um, and so uh, that will change the intergenerational distribution in the sense that um, uh, those who've got a lot more gross assets um, will go backwards relative to those with fewer assets. So it'll be... Um, it'll have the biggest effect on those with the most assets. So that's 70 year olds, as we've said. Actually, they've done very nicely out of the last 20 years, so I'm not you know, holding a candle for that. Um, uh, the only people who will do quite well out of it are the people who haven't bought a house yet. The people who've just bought a house, of course, will be the people who, in effect, do worse out of it. Mm. Uh, so a two percentage point rise in interest rates from where we are today would be pretty catastrophic for most households that have just bought a house. Uh, and it'll certainly make it very difficult to make, for them to make it meet, ends meet. Our guess is that most of them will make ends meet. In fact, where it will really flow through is that essentially you will see um, household spending fall like a stone because people essentially have to save more to pay off the mortgage. Hmm. Anyone else on that point? Uh, I would say that I'm not as pessimistic on that view because I think if you look at where banks are assessing people's servicing capability, it's oh. a lot higher than where it is. And I think the scenario that makes Australian interest rates go up 2% is a very strong economic environment. Yes. It means wages are very strong. Yeah. Um, and so notwithstanding the Reserve Bank's current um, hope, I'd say, that's what Governor Lowe has, is that rates will go up or wages will go up and we'll, we'll normalise. 
I think the, the RBA is wishing that that actually eventuates because I think it's a lot further away than what they, they think or it will be. Or it's an environment in which global interest rates go up yeah. a long way because, of course, you know, those global interest rates are a material impact on, on the interest rates that banks actually charge Australians. Mm -hmm. And it is worth remembering that, Australia, that globally interest rates are currently at their lowest in at least 5,000 years. Yes, I love that. They are very, very yeah. abnormally low. Mm. And the thing that I find most terrifying about that is you listen carefully to international central bankers about why are they so low, so low, and their answer is, we don't really know. Mm. We've got a whole bunch of theories, none of which are kind of wildly convincing. Yeah. And then how do we get from here to, quote, normal, if we sort of take, you know, typical interest rates of the last... 5,000 years uh, as being, quote, normal, and they sort of shuffle and look at their feet at that point and say, we don't really know how we get from here to there, but it could very easily be a little unpleasant. Hmm. John, John manages to find a grey lining on every silver cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, change. Some people will win, some people will lose. All those people with vast accumulated equity will have less, and the renters who can't get on the property ladder get on it. <laughs> right? Some people will win. Yeah, that's, that's true. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm about to slip my wrist listening to these guys. Aren't you? <laughs> Things are pretty good. Yes. We have a pretty good system. It is not perfect. Okay, yes. it's not about pulling it down. It's about doing some renovation. Uh, yeah, and and I think on that also, you know, we're looking at this through a through a, through an absolute lens, but relative to you know, most other parts of the world, there'll be people who would love to have the superannuation system we got, to love to have the safety net you know, to love to have all the things that we've got. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to raise yeah. the base, so to speak, but I think we've got to look at through that lens as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm based in London these days, and uh, people say to me, why are you people complaining? Yeah. Are you on drugs? <laughs> let me, if you're in the UK, let me tell you the situation. The state pension in the UK is £8,000. Mm. £8,000, about $15,000. If you're in the private sector, your average account balance Pre-retirement is about £45,000. Okay, we are miles ahead. They are just moving to semi-compulsory contributions now. Yep. We are so far ahead, it's not funny. But let me, let me put that in context. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for the problem. So the problem <laughs> is that the typical graduate salary is now less than the pension in the UK. Oh, here we go. The next generation's going to do worse. They're not. They well, <laughs> if you want to understand why UK politics oh, has just God. become very volatile, that's it in a nutshell. That's the first time that has ever happened. OK, so, so that <laughs> may be true. However, do we, do, we really, do we really think humanity is going down the drain from this point? I mean, we'll we're, we're all be ruined. <laughs> and so, what are, the, what are the best ideas, whether in, whether in, um, in terms of specific to superannuation, um, and there's something on the, on the board here about any discussion on intergenerational gifting within super to kickstart younger low balance members. So any, any thoughts on policy changes within super or more broadly, be that negative gearing or, or indeed um, depending on what Labor would choose to do if it was elected with um, the proceeds of uh, winding back uh, uh, ca uh, cash credits um, on, on, on dividend imputation. What are the ideas that start to uh, uh, reduce the inequality uh, between people who work in different ways and through generations? It's called tax. <laughs> that is kind of the idea. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the problems with inheritances is that um, certainly the studies that have been done around the world is that they are very, very wealth concentrating. Basically, people who inherit tend to be people who are already rich. Uh, an already high income. The Australian data on inheritance is pretty um, wobbly. The only data source we have is HILDA. Um, uh, and that's because, of course, one of the virtues of a wealth tax is you get really good data on wealth. And the virtues of an inheritance tax is you get really good um, uh, data on inheritance. We don't have either of those things, uh, so we don't have particularly good data. Um, but what we can see from inheritance is that, so far at least, Australia has followed the global patterns. People who are already high income um, are much more likely to get an inheritance, and if they do, it's much more likely to be a large inheritance. Uh, and of course, um, you're much more likely to get an inheritance if you are 65 than 35, because obviously when your average life expectancy is 85, you kind of tend to be 65 before your parents die. 
Um, so that's one issue. Um, the, if you're really serious about this, basically we've got to deal with the way that people over the age of 65 in Australia have opted out of the tax system. Um, series of gifties from Tony, um, uh, from Peter Costello meant that people um, who are over 65 pay less tax on a given income than people who are younger. Why? Well, as Peter Costello said, as he introduced it, because they deserve it. Um, so, you know, the percentage of uh, over 65s pay, paying tax has dropped from about 25% of households, I think, sorry, of individuals to about 14%. Uh, and that's because a combination of tax free super um, and uh, this seniors and pensioners tax offset has meant that very few of them um, have to pay any tax, even if they've got material incomes. And as we've seen, they're very comfortable. Uh, and if you look at more objective measures of comfort, because we've been talking about this as a subjective measure, I think it's a real contribution for that reason. The ABS has a really useful survey in which they ask, um, as a result of uh, not enough money, did you in the last, I think it's month, or it might be three months, did you in the last month um, not pay the utility bill, go without meals, mm. Uh, not pay the car registration. There's something else, I can't remember, there's something else in the same category. So it's a relatively objective measure. Um, and even if you look at pensioners who are renting, they are typically under less stress than working age households who own their own home, but are one way or another on welfare. And they're on tip similar levels of stress to working households, i.e. getting an income, who are renting. And it's worth remembering, that of working age households, a much larger percentage of them are, are renting. And, so, there, and, and what point are you making there? Well, the point I'm making is this stress that we are seeing is very, very much under, for the younger generations. And one of the issues is we've got a generation of 65 year olds who are really wealthy, in effect have quite high disposable incomes, and they pay very, very little tax. If you want to do something about inequality, tax them. And John, do you see any of the suite of um, uh, proposals in that regard, whether they be negative gearing or around dividend imputation that Labor's proposing, having any great impact on this wealth inequality and the distribution of wealth across generations? I don't think that's going to change. I think, I think you know, the good policy for me is about let's look at what's coming towards us. I mean, we talk about the here and now, and I want to get elected next election. That's different to what's happening in the next 30 years. You know, so people started work at 20, they worked to 65, they were dead by 75. Mm -hmm. right? Now they start work at 25 because they do a double degree, they have a gap year, they go and work in Uganda on an you know, educational thing, they start at 25, they retire at 70, and they're going to live another 30 years. So the, the, the demographics have changed significantly. The policies we need to bring need to address those issues. I mean, we can tinker at the edges, but tax is important, I think, around getting the tax balance right. Obviously, getting more people into super and using super, but that's, I mean, that, there's an opt-in there. If, if you bear in mind the scale of what the ALP proposed in terms of those tax credits, it's five billion a year. That is actually big enough to care, and almost all of it comes from the top 20% of retirees. Almost all yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the, the whole cap on super at 1.6 million dollars per person. I mean, that was an AFR article, right? Because no one else was worried about it. They were just hoping they'd get to a number, which was, you know, in aggregate, if it got to seven figures, they were very, very happy. So I think the, the, some of the policies that, you know, which are impact, impacting the top 1%, we need to not worry about those. That, that's, to some extent, noise. I mean, dividend imputation, my mother, she gets a rebate. She doesn't need a rebate, you know. It's nice to get the extra $4,000, but she should be paying her way. Mm. Um, so, but. On the other point that you, <laughs> I don't get it, but I think she should pay her way. I, I don't have a problem with that, you know. Sorry, can I can I speak for my mum? <laughs> Absolutely. How's my, she going? My my mum has, she has a house and she has a hundred thousand dollars in right. her pension account. Yeah. Right. She probably gets some that some incremental value from these refunded credits. She's pretty typical. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. John's never seen a tax he didn't like the look of, quite frankly. <laughs> But, but, oh, no, no, but, but that's taxing, very taxing is not the answer to all this, right? This is oversimplifying the situation. I think you know, the, we, we have a national plan called super. It is being eroded. It's no longer universal. We, we need to patch it up and make sure it is universal. And, and you think, coming back to your report to, to finish off, that, that, that reimagining, and you know, we seem to spend every year saying, what's the objective of super and wandering around like Hamlet where it's, when it's pretty clear to a lot of people in the industry, but redefining super 
and the super guarantee as an entitlement of work as the, <clears throat> as the starting point for uh, reform to try and catch these people, this fifth of people that you estimate are outside the system, is a start to underpinning retirement incomes, whether or not you ever um, start to close the gap in terms of inequality? We do. We've, we've lost our ability to tell a narrative. The, I mean, the great reforms in super about a narrative, about the introduction of ward-based super, then the SG, they were part of a terrific narrative. And we, we have lost that narrative. We need to be able to tell that again about what is the purpose of super, what is it there to do, and, and who should be part of that. Mm. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you very much for your questions that you've sent through. Please thank the panel.